I came to the New England Journal of Medicine in 1979, starting about then, was when you saw the drug companies assert more and more control. Until finally, they, over the next couple of decades, they began to treat the researchers as hired hands. They would design the research themselves. You know, you can do a lot of mischief in how you design a trial. Or we'll test this drug and we'll tell you whether it can be published or not. And so if it's a positive study, it's published. If it's a negative study, you never see the light of day. As she applied due diligence to the many studies submitted to the New England Journal of Medicine, it started to feel like a losing battle. I would call up and say, okay, you've shown that your drug is pretty good, uh, but there's not a single side effect. Any drug that does anything is going to have some side effects. And I had people say, well, the sponsor won't let me. And so I became to be extremely distrustful of most of the research that was published. We did our very best. We often rejected things because it was clearly biased. Uh, but anything we rejected always ended up in another journal. All Angel left the New England Journal of Medicine in 2000, but kept her eye on the journal industry, which she says resisted meaningful efforts to rein in conflicts of interest. In 2009, she wrote an article that famously declared, it is simply no longer possible to believe much of the clinical research that is published. What would you say is the state of the journal landscape today, and the New England Journal of Medicine particularly? I think that that role that the New England Journal used to fill, one was the role of being skeptical, the other was the role of caring about the ethics of the whole system. I think the journal has given that up. The New England Journal of Medicine has given that up. Besides Dr. Angel, another powerful voice is also weighing in. The current editor-in-chief of the British journal Lancet, Dr. Richard Horton, wrote a scathing editorial saying much of the scientific literature, perhaps half, may simply be untrue. Science has taken a turn towards darkness. Dr. Eric Pullman got $2.9 million in federal grants and published hundreds of medical articles on obesity and menopause before he got caught fabricating data while at the University of Vermont School of Medicine. In 2005, he became the first academic researcher sentenced to prison for fraudulent studies. From 1992 to 2012, taxpayers shelled out $58 million to scientists whose papers were later retracted due to misconduct. What do you see as the potential risk or peril of doctors reading these journal articles that may be fraught with conflicts of interest or may be inaccurate. It ends up that a lot of us end up getting bought by the pharmaceutical industry. Interestingly, we rely a lot on the pharmaceutical industry to tell us about what's good about their drug and to convince us to use it. And um, we're not as critically inquisitive as we should be about you know, whether a drug is, is truly uh, helpful, what are the side effects, what are the downsides of using the medications. Today, Angel is at Harvard Medical School. She says experience has taught her to question nearly all the studies she reads in medical journals or hears about on the news. Anything you're going to put in your body, I think, there should be more than one study showing roughly the same results, ideally coming at it from different directions. What you want to see is something that's not going to get the front pages of the newspaper, that's going to be way in the back, that, that says, yet again, this drug has been shown to be helpful. That's the one you should take, not the one that gets the headlines.